Thank you very much, Keith. I think that gives a beautiful perspective of uh, where we should place the 17.1 project. Um, because that's indeed what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's the development project sponsored by the Transmart Pro Alliance, and uh, it's the Hive now executing this one. Um, you see all the parties involved in there. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and in short, I want to show you, uh, so first I'll go to the, to the functional side, but then Piotr will go to the technical side. Um, I want to show you how 17.1 is going to make um, life more fun, both for uh, our scientific users uh, as for our developers. Um, and I think Piotr will cover the, the last part mainly. Um, so this is my agenda slide. Um, first I'll do a little bit on the backstory. Um, how did we get here? What are we trying to solve? Um, then I go into the technical improvements briefly because that's mainly Piotr's part. Um, and I think if you if you tune off uh, during Piotr's talk, that, that you're probably not a developer. That that's fine. If you don't understand my presentation, I guess you're probably in the wrong room. Um, so th this should be functional and high level. Should be should be very doable. Uh, so next I'll go into the functional improvements. Um, first of all, there's some crucial functionality that we're implementing. That's the main part. Um, but there are also some things which will um, seem to be technical, but will give uh, the user really some benefits in having a stable platform. So we want uh, backwards compatibility and an upgrade path. Um, so you can really use Transmart in your, in your, um, in your uh, complex commercial setup. Uh, and we want documentations and tests so we can make sure that we can easily add new features. Um, and then lastly, I'll cover the project structure. So the backstory, what are we trying to solve? Um, I try to um, do this nice visualization of scaling them to relative importance. Um, so missing functionality is, uh, is definitely the most important part here. And you've heard about this before, time series, samples, cross-study concepts. Um, this is stuff that used to be in I2B2 that we don't have in Transmart anymore, which is really necessary. Um, to, to, to fix this um, so we can implement our, our data sets in, in the same way. Uh, that should be, should be much more fun for uh, our users and for our data managers. Um, other functionalities, transcript level RNA-seq data is a data type that we will be adding and also the support for large scale file storage. Um, then on the code side, uh, again, uh, Piotr will go into this, but there's a few things I want to highlight here already. We have a kind of monolithic architecture now where we have the back end and the front end integrated, which makes it a little bit harder to maintain. Um, we don't have a lot of automated tests, so it makes it harder to test whether something broke. Um, we're on an old version of Grails in Java. Um, we have a lot of uh, code repositories. It makes it pretty hard to get into the development. Um, and the database has no documentation. I think uh, I think uh, the people from uh, from Rancho were stressing this uh, quite, quite uh, strongly already, uh, this is really necessary to, to have a, a good ETL tools and to make sure that we don't <laughs> break things. Um, so briefly on one, the, the monolithic part architecture. Um, so we're going to make sure that we decouple the front end and the, and the back end. And the, the current project 17.1 is only on the back end side. Um, so the UI will don't get any, any new, s new stuff here. Um, so we're focusing on this stable commercial grid quality core. Um, and uh, you can access all these new features via the API. And, and we've seen many examples of API clients this, uh, these, uh, these days, like the new UI that, uh, that Vivo has shown, but also the Spotfire uh, client, etc. Um, so we can have this nice ecosystem of all kinds of different uh, apps on top of this REST API. Um, you might ask, why are we only doing the backend here? Well, First of all, the current UI, um, as we have shown, um, has some problems. Uh, we cannot really continue with that one. We don't think that's a, that's a good investment. Uh, it makes some assumptions, uh, which I'll come back to later, and, and the code is, is a little bit out outdated. Um, on the other hand, there's already enough work in the back end here. So uh, this is quite a big project. Um, we we'll just need to do a new project at some point for, for, the, for the UI. Um, and there are some things that should make you a little bit more comfortable with this, that we have uh, some backwards compatibility in here, which we'll also come back to. All your current data, if you're in 16.1 or 16.2, should still work in the current Transport App UI. Um, so you cannot take advantage of the new features in the UI, but you can at least use your old data like that was. Um, 
And the 17.1 project is a development project. It's not the full 17.1 release. So the 17.1 project is, of course, a big project that will flow into the 17.1 release, but also other features from the community will be integrated there. Like uh, the guys from Smart are making uh, important uh, improvements there. Um, so that is um, the description of what I'm going to talk about. If you really want to get down into the details, I just made both the design document and the requirements available on the wiki, the Transport Foundation wiki. You can go there now, you can type this link, you can, you can drill really into what are the exact requirements, um, what are the acceptance criteria. Of course, this is all subject to change. It's, it's up to the people in the, in the project who are uh, actually executing this, uh, how strongly they want to do this, but at least you can have a good idea of what our plans are and maybe you can even prepare your company of yourself what you what you want to do with that um, so first functional improvement that we're doing time series samples and cross study so this is a big one this is the main one um, and we're aligning with i2b2 again to make that possible and we're even extending the i2b2 data model a little bit so a little bit of history transport was developed on top of i2b2 i guess as most of you know it was developed in Janssen by uh, recommend now Deloitte um, to combine clinical data with omics data. And I2B2 had all these uh, nice things like um, cross-study concepts, where you can have the same concept in multiple studies, but still be the same concept. Um, and uh, the support for storing samples and time series, it's all there in I2B2. But we lost this in Transmart because of um, we went um, quite study-specific, uh, and at some point just the assumption grow, especially in the UI, that one patient concept pair has one value. I have a little bit more, uh, some examples on here. So what does concepts or study specific mean? Um, so if you have the concept H in study A and concept H in study B, that's not the same concept as far as Transmart is concerned. It doesn't know it's the same. So I cannot ask Transmart, give me all subjects in my database, which are over 50, um, because it doesn't know what, that these concepts are all both H. So that's, that's inconvenient. You can only do these things within a study. Um, and this patient concept pair sounds a little bit fake too. So here's an example. Patient, John in this case, uh, has for this value heart rate. He can only have one value, 80, 80 BPM, for example. So if you measure the heart rate of John twice, you cannot say, well, at a, some other point he had for heart rate, this other value of the, of the heart rate. You really need to say the concept is heart rate at time point one or heart rate at time point two which is not convenient if you just want to know, for example, give me all observations where the heart rate was over X. So that's something I want to bring back. Um, in all these cases, time series samples and cross-study concepts, I'll go a little bit more in detail what that means. Because time series, you have quite some different time series. You have absolute time, where you really have um, a real timestamp when it happened. You have relative time, something like you might see in a, in a clinical uh, setting. Um, and you have ordinal time, which is where you don't know um, exactly what the time reference was, but you only know the order of the events. Um, absolute time is something which is modeled perfectly in I2B2. Um, you can have timestamps with observations, really when you measured it. And you can even have a grouping of multiple observations in one visit. For example, I go to the hospital, I'm there for the entire day, so this visit has this timestamp, so when I came in and when I came out, and then you have multiple observations within there. Um, but um, this is really absolute time, and also this grouping of multiple observations to one kind of visit, as I2B2 calls it, is study specific. You don't go with two people to the same hospital at exactly the same time. You don't share this visit. These are two separate visits. Um, but in a clinical trial, you might have more visits which are structured and shared over, the, over multiple um, over multiple patients. So everyone in your study might have a baseline observation. Everyone might have a week one observation. Um, so this is shared concept. And this is something which also I2B2 does a model um, so and which is crucial for Transmart. So we had to think of a way how to support that. Um, so I'll show you how we um, propose to implement that. Uh, but then the samples, again, um, there's two kind of different samples. <laughs> And the one is the, the, the kind of sample, so these are samples where you have multiple observations for the same concept and patients, but it's not differenti differentiated by time. So for example, in TCGA, I have a tumor and normal sample, um, or I have multiple doses of the same drug that I gave to the same patient, 
or have uh, observation for multiple tissues in the same patient. These are things we can model by using modifiers, as I2B2 has them. Um, so basically, you take your observation, you have multiple observations with the same patient and the same concept, and you hang some extra modifier on that. So the dose here was this, the dose here was that, <coughs> to make them unique and different. And in some cases, you have even samples where really nothing is different, except for that it's a replica. So then we have a kind of instance num column, which we can increment, just this is the one, first one, the second one, etc. cetera. Um, <coughs> And then lastly, for the cross-study concepts, um, I explained this before, we want to have age in the same study, in different studies, to be the same concept. Because we just want to ask the database, give me everyone of age over 50, from all studies. Um, and also a requirement we had is that we want to use, be able to use ontology codes. And even ontology codes from an, an external ontology server. So I want to use the preferred terms from my ontology server in the, in the database. Um, so this is great, supported by I2B2. Um, and, and this brings us a little bit away from this, this study specificness, as Transmart says. But the study specificness is also a power of Transmart. It's something we like. Um, we load the data by study. It's a really common use case. And we like to set this access on the study level in Transmart. So we need to be able to support both. Um, it's not just everything cross-study and everyone can access everything. Um, but we want to be able to have studies too. So this is the um, simplified data model that I basically abstracted from the full data model. Um, where you have, okay, so you have an observation here in the middle and each patient and each concept can have multiple observations and you can uh, link them together. So we have obs observation, um, the heart rate was 80, the, the heart rate concept was 80 for uh, John, the specific patient. This, so that's what Transmart currently supported. Um, but as said, we're bringing back from I2B2. Um, we're going to, to align the data model such that we're using the columns in exactly the same way as I2B2 is doing that. Um, that we can have on observation level, we can have a start date to make um, these observations unique. And you can have an optional end date too. Um, you can have this instance num column to make multiple replicas uh, unique. And you can even have this grouping of the visit. So that's, that's what I2B2 has. And then um, I mentioned two things which I2B2 uh, didn't model. Y you can probably model in, in I2B2, but it's not a first class citizen to model. Um, so we want to have at this trial visit, um, uh, which is basically in the, the baseline, the week one. Um, and the trial visit is also what will link us to the study. Um, because these are two things that Transmart has which I2B2 doesn't have, and it's nice to just keep that in one dimension here. Um, a trial visit, as you can see here, has a value, a unit, and a label, which might, for example, be I have baseline and I have week one, and then uh, to make sure that I can scale them nicely on an on a x-axis, for example, um, we say um, the baseline has value zero and unit days, so zero days, and uh, um, week one has um, unit days value seven. So it knows nicely how to scale that on, a, on an axis. Okay, um, uh, what I didn't put in here is the modifiers, but basically that's an extra dimension here, which you can help make, uh, you can use to make your observations unique. So I guess this might be very abstract, so I put three examples in here um, where we can uh, model this together. Um, I gave the answers already, sorry. Um, so there's no interactive exercise. So but let's say I have a study where you have a tumor and normal samples. So how you do this, you can, um, you, currently in Transmart you would need to make different concepts out of that, but here we can make them different by using the modifier. So basically here uh, on observation, we would use, um, for the same observation, we would use a modifier tumor and a modifier normal uh, in this tissue modifier to make them unique. And in this case, uh, when you don't use them, you can just leave the start date and the end date empty. And uh, for the trial visit, in the case your study doesn't have any trial visits, you will just use one trial visit um, for all observations within a study to link them all to the same study. So we just add one row in the trial visit to link them to a study. Example two, um, where we have a clinical trial with multiple time points. Um, so this structured kind of time points. Baseline week one, week two, shared time points. 
Um, here we can make the observations uh, unique by using the trial visit dimension, uh, obviously. So um, all observations will be linked to a trial visit, depending on which, uh, whether they're baseline or whether they're week one observations. And these will all be linked to the same study eventually here on the, on the bottom. Um, and again, as I mentioned here before, it will have a value of 0, 7, and 14 days to make sure you can scale them nicely. Um, and then the example of an um, EHR data set, which is one of the things why we're doing this, to make sure that we can get those data sets in. Um, this is a little bit more complicated. It's just at least a little bit more text. Um, you can differentiate, differentiate these observations by both using the start and end date on the observation level, um, you can use different visits, and those can have different start end dates, and you can even have these instant nums, might you have multiple uh, replications. Um, so that's basically what it says here. You can use the start and end date um, for the observation. You can use the instance num as soon as you have uh, multiple replicates. And um, yeah, you have just one. Uh, you can have multiple visits. I is the, these are in the data set available. Um, these visits will have their date, date set, and all of these, um, all of these uh, observations will together have the same trial visit to link them to the study. Um, you can even combine multiple of these. So let's say you have an EHR data and you want retrospectively to map there some, this was the first encounter for everyone or something. You might even be able to do that. So these are the examples for time series and samples. Um, then this was a special request from Wim, uh, how to query time series. Um, so um, you, first you want to store them, of course, in your database, but then you want to get them out, right, the REST API. So you can um, query observations. And here um, you want to query observations based on start and end time. So give me all observations between these times. Um, you want to query observations uh, on minimum maximum average value, before, uh, for example. So give me um, um, the give me uh, all observations where the minimum of the observations for a patient were under this or where the maximum was over this. Um, and as you can do in ITB2, you can also define a set of events and define the relations between those events, um, and then get all the observations back that that ap apply for that criteria. Um, so for example, you have an event. Give me all blood pressure readings for a patient. And then you have an event, give me the first drug use of the patient. And you could say, give me all of the observations where A, a blood pressure reading, happened at least a week after any of the first drug use by the patient. So then you get a set of observations back. So besides querying on observations, you can also query on patients. So give me all patients back which um, have certain criteria, um, where all observations are um, of high blood pressure to supply of a drug, yeah. Um, and then you can also query the aggregated values. So give me, for a numerical value, give me the minimum range for all these observations back. Um, so that's um, what I have on the time series and samples. Then on the transcript level, uh, RNA-seq data. Um, this is a special request from, from EPFI, basically. Um, so I thought it would be nice maybe to put a, a slight overview in here of which data types we currently support. Um, I guess you will notice, but there is metadata, there is clinical data, or the low-dimensional data, as Transmart calls it, in which you can model all kinds of things, as long as they're categorical and numerical. You have the gene expression data, both from arrays and from RNA sequencing. You have um, copy number variation data, for example, from HGH. You have small genomic variance data, in both in SNP format and in, and in VCF format. You have, um, Large-scale genomic variations, someone started with that at some point. If someone is interested, you could finish it. Um, proteomics data, metabolomics data. But on the mRNA sequencing gene expression data, uh, all the data was linked to genes. And um, EPFI had uh, transcript-level RNA-seq data, and they wanted to be able to model that also in the database. So what we're doing there is adding an extra data type where uh, the measurements are linked to transcripts instead of genes. Um, you can see here an example of how we propose now to be the data format when you load it. Um, the measurements are just the same, read count, normalized read count, disease score, as you have for the currently current RNA-seq uh, gene expression data. Um, 
And then you have dictionaries, as Transmart has for all kinds of biomarkers, that will link the genes to a transcript. So when I'm searching, give me all the um, uh, RNA-seq observations back for TP53, it will have somewhere uh, a mapping of TP53, then I need to have these transcripts, and it can give you the transcript level data back for these transcripts. And then the, large big, uh, the, the last big uh, functional requirement is um, large file storage, and for this we're linking with Arvados. And it's a little bit sad that Tom Morris wasn't here earlier today, um, because otherwise you would know by now what Arvados is, and now I, I have to explain it. Um, so Arvados is a big scalable system. It's developed by QReverse, which is the company. Um, well, th they developed this behind the personal genomes project. So they needed a big scalable gen genomic solution um, for that. The main two parts that we're using is Keep, which is the storage layer. Um, has nice uh, content addressable storage, so you automatically do duplicate everything that's being stored. Um, and uh, you can store it nicely on a cluster and the cloud and stuff. Um, and it has a workflow system crunch where you can run big workflows also on clusters. Um, so Roche was really interested in to for their, their data setup to have Transmart for the um, more the, the, the study metadata and then uh, link all the files for the big genomics data in Arvados. Um, so that's basically what we're going to do here. We make sure that in Transmart you can link on a study level to files that are in Arvados. And it would be nice if we can, and we will try to align this with how Sanofi is also using uh, this to link studies, uh, link files on a study level to MongoDB. And the eventual goal is that when you look in the Transmart UI, um, you can see which files are linked to my study, and even you can start some specific workflows on those. So for example, in my study, I see all BAM files related to my study. I might think, wow, I'd like to have some VCF files so I can load those in Transmart. I can start this BAM to VCF um, variant caller, and, um, I might and I start those on the files that are in Arvados, and these files get automatically also linked again to my study there. And later I can even upload them from Transmart. So that's the, the long-term goal here. Will not all be realized as FT01, but um, we'll start with the linking here. Okay, so a um, little bit less tangible things. Backwards compatibility and upgrade path, still really important if you run this in a, in a, in a big setup and not uh, just uh, on your own machine. Um, so first, the upgrade path, data migration. What we include in the project, as long as you have your data currently in a 16.1 or 16.2 um, um, database, then we'll make sure that you have a data migration upgrade path to 17.1. Um, and going forward, it should be even easier because we're suggesting now to use Liquibase to make snapshots of the database. So um, instead of that, we have some random SQL scripts lying around um, that you need to know uh, how to upgrade to your next database version. Uh, Liquibase will basically kind of generate these files for you. And it makes it easier going forward to track the database just like we're tracking the code as in the source control. Then the backwards compatibility. Um, if your data, if you have currently your data in 16.1 or 16.2, again, um, then uh, what's included is that the old Transmart app or the current Transmart app, sorry, um, will still work on your current data uh, if you upgrade to 17.1. So um, you might load some extra studies uh, which have new features. You cannot use those in the UI, but you can still use them via the REST API. And you can still use your old studies or current studies in the current UI as, you, as you're used to. Um, so this will not work with the new uh, time series samples cross study uh, concepts. And plugins are also something which we cannot guarantee on the disk, but it might very well work. And otherwise there should be some small adjustments. And then for the REST clients, um, we're going to version the API, the REST API. Um, all REST clients, like my Android app, will need to make a really small adjustment that they need to say, I want to talk to the version one uh, of, the, of the REST API. Um, and then they should be just continuing as, they, as they're currently doing. New REST clients will be able to use the, the version two uh, of the API, which will also support time series samples, etc. And Piotr will go into more what the technical details here are. More um, 
oh, kind of tangible things. Documentation and automated testing. I know people have been screaming for this too. Um, documentation, what we uh, have decided under the project is that we will provide documentation for all available REST and core API calls. So if you want to um, implement anything, you, you should know which calls you can use, and which are available. And also the data model will be described. Um, yeah, the complete data model and how things are related between that. So if you know how to build your ETL tool, I guess um, people like Thomson Reuters will, will, will like this. Um, and then the automated testing. I've included a picture here from our, uh, from our, uh, our new, uh, newly hired tester. Um, the core API will have um, unit and integration tests, and the test coverage will be at least of 70%, which is, uh, I think, a pretty, pretty high and standard for, for good software. And the RESTful API will have uh, automated functional tests for all API calls. So next time someone develops something, you can just run the test suite and see if you broke anything of these, uh, of these parts. And I think in the picture it's a little bit clearer. So we have uh, all these different transport repositories. The version one API for the REST API already has some quite some tests. The new version two API will get those tests when we develop this. And the transport app will have some backwards compatibility tests to make sure that they still work. Okay, so that's the content of the project and then the structure. Uh, the GC, the TSC, and the PMC, and there is uh, the, e the EU TAP also. Um, I'll go into the abbreviations, but these are the involved parties. So, of course, we have the Transport Foundation who's leading this effort and who brought all the parties here together. Um, and then we have uh, four uh, amazing pharma parties which stood up uh, to, to fund this project and to make it happen. Uh, we have Pfizer, we have Roche, we have Apfi and Sanofi, and then the Hive was chosen for this project to execute the project. Um, how are they structured? How's the project structured? So this little dotted line, that's the 1701 project. Um, in there we have the uh, Transmart Pro Governing Committee, which are the high-level people, and they will concern themselves with business decisions. We have from all the sponsors, we have people in there, and for the Transmart Foundation, we have people in there. Um, then the people who are really doing the day-to-day -day work is the, the Technical Steering Committee. Um, and this is again consists of the sponsors and the, and the Transport Foundation, and they make the technical decisions on the project. They can consult the, uh, the end user uh, advisory board, end user technical advisory board. Um, this will have uh, all kinds of end users, should be representative of their end users. And they can even, even get people from outside the sponsors in there if they, if they deem necessary. Um, and then, um, of course, there's the Hive uh, executing the project in here. And then outside the project, but very much related, of course, to the project, is the 1701 Project Management Committee, just as we had project management committees for 1601, 1602. Um, this is basically the entire community making sure that we get a great release eventually together, of which, again, the Transmart 1701 development project is one of the, the things that come in there. A big one, but still one of the projects coming in there. So the, trans the, the TSC will be uh, involved there, the Technical uh, Steering Committee. Uh, but also other partners uh, know that at least ITTM, Cureverse, and Clarifate are already confirmed to, to, to be in here because they're doing developments there. Um, but I guess um, if we look at current PMCs, there might, might very well be others involved. Okay, um, then on the technical steering committee, um, I put the names up here from the people uh, that are, are running this week to week. Um, to make Jay happy, I didn't put any pictures in here, uh, but uh, at least... Um, but I guess if you have any questions, opinions, or uh, I think y these are, are the right people to talk to. So you have Jay from Pfizer, you have Thomas uh, from Roche and Heike from Sanofi, who uh, sadly couldn't be here. Samantha was here uh, the previous days. And then we have uh, Yiki Guo, who is now uh, the customer representative and the chair of this committee. Um, he also couldn't be here, but his people were here, of course. Um, and uh, you might remember that Keith Nangle uh, was doing this with Keith Nangle sadly resigned from the foundation. So this is now done by, by Yike Guo. And um, he has people visiting the hive every two weeks, so we make sure that we, we stay aligned on that. And then um, who is doing this inside the hive? Um, we have Eric on the top left, who is doing the project management. We have Gijs, who is, doing the, uh, is the technical lead on the project. Uh, myself, I'm the business analyst, maybe I should have said that at the beginning. Um, but uh, we have the development team, 
and two of them are available here, Piotr and Ruslan, you heard them before. Um, uh, they're uh, both uh, long-term transport developers, as are, are many of the others here, um, Jan, Evelina, Olaf. Um, Bartolt is the automated testing guy, he's just, uh, just started with us, but he's doing already great work on making sure that uh, this uh, stays up and running. So the timeline, of course, that's really interesting. Um, module A and B, which is the time series samples cross study concepts part and the transcript level RNA-seq, should be finished by the end of 2016. And then um, the module C, the linking with Arvados, and the entire project should be finished by the end of Q1 2017. So then we have an end product for the development project. Uh, again, as said, this needs to be rolled into the release together with all kinds of other features from the community. And that should, of course, be done by Q2 2017 because it's the 17.1 version. And then finally, I want to thank everyone involved, which is, of course, Transfer Foundation for leading this effort. Uh, of course, the, the four pharma parties who, who stepped up and to, to fund this and to make this happen for all of us. Um, some of them are in the, in the community for a long time already, which is amazing. And uh, some of them just make a big bet uh, uh, recently on Transmart, which is also amazing. Uh, I want to thank my team at The Hive, who is doing great work. We have these, these eight developers who are really motivated and doing these stand-ups every day and deeply care about the project. And of course, in the middle, the entire Transmart community who, uh, who made this possible. And that's it. Thank you very much. So I hand it over to Piotr now for the, for the technical details. Uh, if you were a developer, you might, uh, might have uh, thought this was uh, too high level. I'm sure that Piotr...